So I will introduce now Professor Simon Baron Cohen, although I know there is no need. Uh, I am excited and happy to invite Professor Simon Baron Cohen to our virtual stage. I will only share that with typical Israeli chutzpah, uh, Yael and myself approached Professor Baron Cohen via email and modestly asked if he would agree to participate in our seminar. We were so happy to receive his accept acceptance. Uh, professor Baron Cohen is a professor in the Department of Psychology and Psychiatry, University of Cambridge, and a fellow at Trinity College, Cambridge. He is the director of the Autism Research Center in Cambridge. He is an author and has edited scholarly anthologies, including Understanding Other Minds. Today he is with us, and his talk is all about neurodiversity in autism. Kablu. Okay. Thank you very much, Efrat. Uh, shalom to everybody. And uh, I wish I was in Israel with you in person, but here I am in Cambridge in the UK. And um, I hope you have a very good conference. Um, so my talk today is about autism and neurodiversity. And I'll just start by telling you what you already know, uh, that autism is diagnosed on the basis of social difficulties and communication difficulties. Also, uh, difficulties in adjusting to unexpected change. So these are kids and adults who get very stressed when things are not predictable. Uh, they also have what are sometimes called obsessions, uh, but uh, maybe less pejoratively, we could call them narrow interests, uh, and they love predictability, so things that repeat, including their own behavior, is often quite repetitive. But I think this is part of their learning style, and we'll talk about that a little more later. And the American Psychiatric Association in 2013 added one more feature for the diagnosis which is sensory hypersensitivity. So these are children and adults who often experience the world in a very intense way. The, sometimes the sounds can be too loud, the lights can be too bright, uh, the taste and touch of different experiences can be either pleasant or extremely unpleasant. We now know that autism is very common so this is data from um, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in the US, uh, just this year reporting prevalence of 2.3% of the population. So that's one in 44 children or adults. This data came from child data across different states in the US. But what you can see over time is that autism has become more and more common in terms of diagnosis. And probably this just reflects better recognition, greater awareness. And also we are broadening the definition of autism um, and have done uh, really since 1994 with the inclusion of Asperger's syndrome Although that term is no longer used uh, for various reasons, uh, that, that opened up the, the diagnosis of autism to people without learning difficulties and with good language. This graph shows you that autism is diagnosed more often in males than in females. So males are the blue line, much higher prevalence. Females are the black line, lower prevalence. The sex ratio is about three males for every one female. But the graph also shows you that females get their diagnosis later. So you can see in the blue line that boys are getting diagnosed in childhood, as should be the case. 
by about four years old on average. Girls are not really getting their diagnosis until the teens on average. So a delay in diagnosis. And some people suggest that this is because, because of camouflaging, that, autist, that, that girls who have undiagnosed autism may experience greater stigma because of cultural expectation that girls should be communicative and sociable, more so, and that they try to hide their autism until it's just too difficult to do so. So autism is not just um, those diagnostic features I mentioned, because many autistic people have co-occurring conditions. This is just a partial list. Epilepsy in about 15%, learning difficulties in about 25%, so that's below average IQ. Some 5% have almost no language or minimal language. Um, some have medical conditions like gastrointestinal pain, possibly as much as half, half of autistic people. Language delay in about 50%. Poor mental health, which we'll come back to, perhaps in as many as 80% of adults who are autistic. So we have to separate autism from the co-occurring conditions when we try to understand them. So in terms of the title of my talk, um, I want to talk about neurodiversity, um, but there, is, um, there are different models for how we understand autism. Some people see it just as a difference, an example of diversity. Some people see it as a disability uh, where the person is struggling. The American Psychiatric Association describes it as a disorder. And sometimes it's even described as a disease. Uh, I want to argue that all four of these Ds, difference, disability, disorder, disease, are all relevant, depending on which aspect of autism you're looking at. I'm going to focus mostly today on difference, because that's part of diversity. But disability is really why the person gets a diagnosis. If there is no disability, arguably the person doesn't need a diagnosis. And the diagnosis is there to help access support. Disorder is where the person is suffering. And some aspects, as we've seen, um, like epilepsy may cause suffering and could count as a, as a disorder. And disease is where it's a disorder with a known biological mechanism. And again, epilepsy might count, gastrointestinal pain might count. So different symptoms might qualify for each of these descriptions. We know that autism is genetic because it runs in families. So where there's one child in the family who's autistic, the likelihood of the next child in the family also being autistic jumps up to one in three. So in the general population, we said one in 44, but in these families, um, it's as high as one in three. That shows that autism runs in families and there's been progress in identifying the genes associated with autism. This big blue box here shows you a list of rare genetic variants. So these are mutations. Uh, they're rare because they're only found in less than one in a thousand people in the population, but they're more common in autistic people. And these genes are expressed in the brain, as you'd expect, and change brain development. But these rare genetic variants are only found in about 5 or 10% of autistic people. So they can't explain all autistic people. In contrast, recent research is looking at common genetic variants. These are genes that we all carry. 
uh, in different versions of the gene uh, and in different combinations. And when you do very large scale studies, population studies, this one was uh, 28, sorry, this, this was 28,000 people and 18,000 autistic then you see uh, above the red line some common genetic variants are statistically associated with autism. The graph shows you all the human chromosomes, uh, but the red line indicates which of the genes on the different chromosomes are significantly associated with autism. So autism involves genes that we all carry, and in this sense it's related diversity. But we know that autism is not just genetic because you can have identical twins who share a hundred percent of their genes but where one is autistic and one is not autistic like these two sisters. So the existence of such twin pairs who are discordant for autism means that there must be a non-genetic factor or several non-genetic factors that act on the genetic predisposition, interact with the gene genetic predisposition to cause autism. And one non-genetic factor that we've been looking at is prenatal hormones, particularly the sex hormones during pregnancy hormones like testosterone and estrogen, uh, which you can measure in the amniotic fluid around the baby. This was work from our group, and which you can see that autistic people have higher levels of these hormones compared to typical males in the population who in turn have higher levels than typical females. There's a sex difference in the general population the autistic people are slightly elevated. And we know that these hormones change brain development. And you can see diversity within the autistic group, in the typical male population and the typical female population. So what do we mean by diversity? This is a poster from the autism community. Some of you will have seen it before with a statement from an autistic person, Temple Grandin, saying, I am different, but I'm not less. And we're very familiar with the notion of biodiversity, that there are many different types of plants and animals, and one is not better or worse, simply different. And we're familiar with other kinds of diversity, like gender diversity or ethnic diversity, which simply reflects differences, not that one is superior and the other is inferior. And neurodiversity is simply the latest idea to do with diversity, that brains come in different types. One is not better or worse, they're simply different. So how can we measure neurodiversity? I'm a scientist, and although the concept is attractive, we want to be able to measure it. So one way we can measure it is to measure autistic traits in the population. So let's leave aside diagnosis and just think about autistic traits. And what you can see is if you use a measure called the AQ, the Autism Spectrum Quotient, we all have autistic traits. This study was conducted in 600,000 typical people, 36,000 autistic people. Uh, the first author is David Greenberg, who's at Barnard University, published in a prestigious journal, The Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. But what you can see is that here are typical males in purple and typical females in blue. But there's a bell curve in the population. We all have some autistic traits. In red and green are autistic people who are simply shifted over to the right of this graph. So when we look at this, we can visualize 
the spectrum and we can visualize individual differences in the population. And it's not your score on the AQ or on autistic traits that indicates if you need a diagnosis. It's only if you have a high number of autistic traits that are interfering with your ability to function that you might need a diagnosis causing disability. Here's another way we can visualize neurodiversity, and that's just to look at typical children in terms of their language development. There isn't a single track for learning language. You can see that the green line shows you the average child in terms of how quickly their vocabulary grows. But when you look at hundreds or thousands of children, who are, we're looking at almost 5,000 children. Some children are learning language very fast. That's the top line. Some children are learning language very slowly. That's the bottom purple line. But all of these dots are individual children. And you can immediately see neurodiversity. And just because a child is learning language faster or slower than another doesn't say anything about how they'll develop in terms of their adulthood. Some kids are more verbal. Other children are more musical. Other children are more spatial. Um, and uh, we simply have to accept differences and respect differences in development. Here's another way we can measure diversity, and that's to look at empathy. Again, in that same study by David Greenberg, very big data. This is measured online, of course. You can see that uh, women in the population score higher than men. So that's the blue and the purple group. And autistic people score below average. Both males and females who are autistic score below average. They struggle with empathy, the ability to imagine what someone else is thinking or feeling. It doesn't mean that the person is uncaring, because we know that autistic people are kind and do care about others. They have trouble reading emotions, interpreting behavior, um, and what's called cognitive empathy or theory of mind, being able to imagine another person's thoughts and feelings. Once another person's thoughts and feelings are pointed out to an autistic person, they respond in a caring way. If they know that you're in pain, they want to help. If they know that you're suffering, they want to help to re reduce your distress. But reading emotions and thoughts is a struggle. But again, we see diversity in the population. We've also measured systemizing. Systemizing is the ability to analyze a system or build a system, any kind of system. It might be a computer. It might be a bicycle. It might be a piece of music. It might be a computer program. Uh, there are many different kinds of systems in the world. Systems um, follow rules. And when you analyze a system, when you systemize, uh, you're looking to see if you can find the rules that predict how the system works. Sometimes they're very simple systems. And sometimes they're more complex systems. But what we see in the general population is that this time men on average score higher than women in terms of their interest in systems. Uh, and autistic people score even higher in typical males and females. They have a very strong interest in systems because they follow predictable rules. So this is telling us that autism is not just disability, Autism also includes talent, strengths, and think about this in relation to the real world, how they can use their strengths and their talents at school and in employment. Putting all of those data together, this graph shows you empathy along the vertical axis, 
systemizing along the horizontal axis. Everyone in the population had taken both measures, the EQ, the SQ, and we see in yellow, we see women in the population. In green, we see men in the population. And in purple and pink, we see autistic people. This is showing diversity because it's giving rise to different profiles, different cognitive profiles. And we call this, this one at the top type because these individuals' brains are more focused on people and on empathy and on system and on things. This one is called type S because the person is more focused on systems, on objects, systems than on people. And you can see just with the naked eye that there are more women, more yellow dots up here, more men or green dots down here. And autistic people seem to cluster here where they are an extreme of type S, the systemizing brain or type S, where they have difficulty with empathy, they're below average on empathy, but they are intact or even superior in terms of systemizing. But immediately we see that there isn't a normal and an abnormal, there's simply difference in the population. If we make this a bit more concrete, I want to introduce you to two autistic people on the left is Derek, Derek Paravicini. He's autistic, he's also blind, birth, and he has a learning difficulty equivalent to a three-year-old child. But he can play jazz piano to a high professional level. If you go on YouTube, you can hear his music. He's performed across the world. He only has to hear one song, any jazz song, once to be able to play it perfectly and he can transpose it into a new key instantly so he is systemizing auditory patterns um in this case music on the right is matt Park. he's also autistic lives in california um and he is the number one champion for the rubik cube not just the three by three Rubik cube, but the four by four, five by five, and the six by six. So despite his social and communication difficulties and difficulties with cognitive empathy, he can systemize visual patterns. And in my recent book called The Pattern Seekers, I argue that autistic people love patterns in the world and that pattern recognition has been uh, the driver for human progress across human evolution uh, when it comes to invention and, uh, uh, and progress in, in developing new systems. In fact, we see this quite clearly that in that big population of 600,000 people, when we measured autistic traits and divided the population into those who work in STEM, science, technology, engineering, or maths, or non-STEM, you can see that those who work in STEM have more autistic traits, that's red, compared to those who do not work in STEM. So there's a connection between how many autistic traits you have and talent, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, so a connection between autism and aptitude in understanding patterns. And in fact, this connection exists at the genetic level because we were able to work with the company 23andMe which is a personal genomics company. Some of you will have heard of it. You pay a hundred dollars. They send you a saliva kit. You send it back and they tell you which genes you're carrying. The customers of this company 
took the systemizing quotient and we were able to analyze the common genetic variant associated with good systemizing and found a correlation with the common genetic variants associated with autism. So even in our genome, at a molecular level, the genes for autism overlap with the genes for talent at pattern recognition and systemizing. And we can see a last example of diversity, neurodiversity in the brain because post-mortem studies, particularly conducted in San Diego by Eric Korshelin, have found autistic brains at post-mortem have more neurons or nerve cells compared to typical males who in turn have more than typical females. So you can see that typical males have about 22 billion Typical females have 19 billion on average, and autistic people have some 65% more neurons, particularly in the frontal lobe, compared to non-autistic people. Does this reflect uh, disorder? I don't think so. I think this reflects different. There's no suggestion that more or less neurons, better or worse. It's simply different. But we could easily imagine how having more neurons in your brain might mean better attention to detail, but might also mean sensory overload, sometimes too much information, and difficulties in making sense of the world. So there are, there are pros and cons of every different kind of brain type, we all have strengths and weaknesses. But here we're simply seeing difference. We're not seeing disorder or disease. I want to um, talk a little bit about mental health because I mentioned early on in the beginning of the talk that there's poor mental health associated with autism in adults. Um, I don't think that Poor mental health is part of autism. It's likely to be secondary to a lack of support. And in our, in our study in 2014, we asked autistic adults who have intelligence, who can fill in questionnaires online, whether they've ever felt suicidal or planned or attempted suicide. And we found shocking findings that two thirds of autistic adults have felt suicidal and one third of autistic adults have either planned or attempted suicide. This is much higher than in the general population and higher than in many other clinical groups. And it should be a wake up call to our society, any society, that if you leave autistic people without the right support, their mental health will go down and there's the potential of tragedy, both for the individual and their family and their communities. So we need much better support for autistic people. Let me finish with some examples of support and intervention, which I think fits the neurodiversity model. So one example in childhood is Lego clubs. Many autistic children love Lego, probably because it's highly systematic. It follows logic or rules in how you build systems with Lego. Um, with Lego clubs or Lego therapy, the idea is to take the autistic child out of their solitary bedroom where they may be playing with Lego at home and put them into small groups to see whether they can use their talent at systemizing Lego 
to learn social skills. And this work was conducted by a PhD student, Gina Owens. But what you see is in blue, the autistic children who were in the Lego clubs, and in yellow, the autistic children who had no intervention. In pink, our autistic children who, who had a different intervention, speech and language therapy. But what you can see is over time, autistic children who go to Lego clubs improve in their communication, their turn taking, their social skills, their eye contact. So they're learning social skills through doing something that they love and enjoy. Um, the same is true to a lesser level for children having speech and language therapy. So it's not that Lego therapy or Lego clubs are the only intervention. Many interventions are helpful for autistic kids. But what I like about Lego therapy or Lego clubs is it's non-stigmatizing. All children can, um, can access Lego as a toy. Um, in schools, certainly in the UK, but increasingly around the world, Lego clubs are being offered where the autistic child is not stigmatized, but instead is included. Inclusion is the really important word here but where they don't feel um, disabled, they're doing an activity that they're good at and the, the benefits to their social skills are apparent. A second example is from the world of employment. So this is the company Autocon. Some of you will have heard of it. It's operating in about seven different countries. Started in Germany, in the UK, in France, uh, it's in the US. I don't know if it's in Israel yet. Auticon means autistic consultants, that this company only hires autistic people. They hire autistic people who have good pattern recognition skills, such as coding, and they hire them out as consultants to any company needs, for example, coding, coding skills. What this company has realized is that autistic employees need support. So every employee has a support worker so that they're not only being helped into work, but they're being helped to keep the job once they've got the job. And once again, like Lego clubs, this is an example of, uh, in this case, employment, which plays to the person's strengths. The company is essentially ignoring the disability and is saying, you can, if you have the relevant skill, like computer programming, then don't worry about skills, don't worry about communication. That will come with confidence, uh, but it's not essential to the job. And this is just a very nice example of success where hundreds of autistic people are now being employed across the world thanks to a new model of supported employment. And we know that employment is important for mental health. Unemployment is associated with poor mental health. Unemployment also leads the person to feel excluded from society and takes away autonomy. Because if you don't have money in your pocket, you might be uh, living with your parents, dependent on others, and not achieving that sense of self-confidence and self-esteem that comes from autonomy. I want to finish by thanking our team that have done much of the research that I've described, and look forward to having questions and discussion. Thank you. Shailot. The question is, in perspectives of time, uh, what do you think about your theory about the man-brain uh, 
and, and so on. Maybe you can say a word about it for the people who don't really know it. And then yeah, so you saw in some of the data that, uh, that there are sex differences in the general population on average. So for example, women in the population score higher on empathy on average than men and men in the population again, on average, score higher in terms of their interest in systems. And autistic people show an extreme of that profile, an extreme of the typical male profile. So strong interest in patterns or systems and some challenges when it comes to empathy. I think the language of autism as an extreme of the male brain is controversial. So these days I would talk about autism as a particular learning style and a particular brain type with strengths in systemizing and challenges in empathy. But that theory has also given rise to looking at the biology of sex differences, like the prenatal sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen which also influence the type of brain that you end up with. Of course, biology is only one part of what influences brain development. Experience is another important part. But that's a brief answer. The question is... Uh, the question is, is there a connection uh, between IVF, okay? and the uh, autism? Hmm. So um, I'm not aware of any research, but maybe other people know, know of some. I'm not aware of any research which shows that IVF causes autism. Um, there is research that started in Israel and is now widely replicated internationally that parental age is associated with autism. So fathers and mothers who are older are more likely to have an autistic child. And of course, some, sometimes the reason for going for IVF is because the mother is an older mother and is having difficulties uh, in conceiving. So I think, um, you know, the science is telling us that parental age may influence the likelihood of the child being autistic. But IVF itself, as far as I know, is not a cause of autism. Thank you. Yona. Uh, hello. Uh, I wanted to ask you regarding the whole, uh, like you finished, the, you finished the presentation, we're talking about the company Auticon that it believes in, that does the whole uh, putting uh, autistic people in like, in good uh, workplaces. And I wanted to ask you um, about, let's say, in like, not necessarily work ethics, because like when adults usually have more like understanding to that world, usually. But like, how would like, how you think the research and how you think in like worlds of in schools and younger ages, how you think that the research and how to implement into all societies and in all places, yeah. in all systems? Okay, now that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. I mean, the company Auticon is just one example. I would imagine, and this is, this is increasingly happening, that every employer can be hiring autistic people. It doesn't have to be in the IT world. You know, if you have a, a, bake, a baker's business or a bicycle business uh, or any business you have a shop autistic people can be working there a cafe it really doesn't matter the important thing is is the right support in place for the autistic person equally you're asking about school the science that i presented is showing that autistic people have a different learning style they tend to prefer learning about systems and they like to learn in a very systematic way one thing at a time often growing going into one topic in more detail and more depth than a typical child so we need to make reasonable adjustments 
in how we teach autistic children. The Lego clubs that, that I described is a nice example of how some autistic children might learn best in small groups, doing what they enjoy. You know, in our, in our research, there were just three children in each group, sometimes six children in each group. And that's far less overwhelming than putting a child into a group of 20 or 30 children, where there may be too much noise, too much communication, and the child feels overwhelmed and, and, has a, and hates the experience of school. So uh, I didn't have time to go into this kind of detail, but you're absolutely right that in every part of our society, whether it's at school or at work, or even in the world of leisure or public spaces, we need to be making reasonable adjustments for autistic people's disability. Uh, okay. Not a particular question that's like related to like the thing necessarily, but I was just curious to know and like I might have missed it, but like, what's your connection with Voimahok? Like, how did this like start? I'm curious to what's know. My, what's my connection with? Like, um, with like this with Voimahok with this organization, like. Ah, sure, sure. So, um, uh, Rome Rafat. First of all, you know, I love the work that they do. Efrat um, zoomed with me just recently to explain some of the fantastic work that they're doing. And I'm um, extremely pleased to be, uh, to be talking to this group today. Um, my involvement with, so far with Rome Report is uh, really from a, a, a long distance. I hear about the work, I support the work. Please uh, reach out to me if I can be doing anything to, to uh, promote what you're doing and to support what you're doing from uh, an international perspective. Uh, thank you. Hello, Simon. Shalom. Shalom. Uh, so, my, so my question for you is, um, you say that people with autism has, uh, like, how to say that, uh, a special talents, but do people with autism and also uh, this uh, disab intellectual disability, like people with the X uh, syndrome, I don't remember the name, uh, the fragile uh, X syndrome, if you know, do they also have uh, some special, um, uh, how to say that, special talents because they also have autism, uh, although they have intellectual disability? Yeah, now that, this is another very important question. Um, so, so what we now know is that uh, three quarters of autistic people do not have intellectual disability. They have average or even above average intelligence. But one quarter of autistic people do have intellectual disability. Even in this group, you can find strength in pattern recognition compared to non-autistic people of the same intellectual level. So I showed you an example of Derek who plays music, but who has a very low IQ. But despite that, he has a talent in musical patterns. Um, not every autistic person with learning disability or intellectual disability will have fantastic musical ability. But the idea is that for every autistic person, try to find the area that they um, enjoy. Often it's an area to do with patterns. It could be memory, memory for detail, memory for facts. Uh, it could be, um, as we saw with Lego, which doesn't require average intelligence to enjoy, but does involve patterns, building things, taking things apart, understanding how things work. Obviously, we, we need to adapt education and work and leisure to the person's uh, needs and abilities. But the short answer is 
you can see these strengths in every autistic person. Thank you so much. And you shared with me earlier that you need to leave. <laughs> so uh, we thank you. We thank you very, very much. It was very interesting and very important. And we also hope to, to connect and to be in touch. <laughs> OK? Ma? And you are mostly invited at any time, at any day, yeah. to come. And we will be more than happy to host you. Yeah, I would look. I would look forward to visiting Ryan Rachok on my next visit to Israel. Wow. And thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you so much.